It's the Craggy Rugby Podcast. It's a special, quite long pod, this one, actually. Um, the Craggy Crew, or most of the Craggy Crew, were in Marty Rabbits to preview the World Cup for Galway Bay FM for their live Friday night show. Daniel Deegan, William Davis, Dave Finn and Alan Deegan had a panel discussion about the World Cup. They each took a pool and previewed the World Cup um, for every team with a, <laughs> the standard Connacht tinted glasses on there. We also had some special guests who are t- discussing it from a Scottish, New Zealand and South African point of view. We hope you enjoy this free podcast. If you want to support the Craggy Crew, go to patreon.com slash craggyrugby and join up. It only comes around every four years and this is the 10th edition of the Rugby World Cup. started back in 1987. Um, long time ago, different type of rugby. Everybody was amateur then, allegedly. And uh, it was dragged over the line by the Southern Hemisphere. The Northern Hemisphere teams were, were not really that interested. And correctly, South Africa were banned from the first two competitions because of their apartheid government. But for Ireland, they've had nine failures to progress beyond the quarter final. They're in the group of death this time, they say, so we'll check that out and get the views of our panel here and uh, also some of our guests. But uh, can they make it? Can Ireland get beyond the quarterfinal? Sometimes they didn't even get out of the pool stage. So it's, uh, it's a big challenge. We're going to start with some Connacht uh, involvement because there are three Irish players in the 33-man initial squad, not so much the initial squad, but the squad that's gone to France. They travelled yesterday because uh, they have to actually all be in place by the 1st of September over there. Uh, but we have three players selected so far. So I'm going to start with Danny Deegan, and he's going to talk to me about Bundy Archie. Now, you named your dog after Bundy, um, <laughs> which is quite a, fa- quite a famous dog at this stage. But... Just give me a surmise. What what is he bringing now? He's an experienced player. What's he bringing to this Ireland team? Yeah, he's an experienced international. He's also a um, a British and Irish lion. Like you don't get to be an, uh, a British and Irish lion out of nothing. Um, he's got a, an incredible record with Ireland. He's got uh, 47 matches and he's won 38 of them. That's an 80 percent winning record. Like, that's that's very impressive at the, at the highest level uh, of what you're looking at. Um, like anybody that uh, comes and watches Connacht or listens to the Craggy podcast like everything that Connacht was doing for a long time was all coming through Bundy and he brought that same energy and um, ability to Ireland and you can see when he plays 12 it's always go forward ball and he, he's great he's also improved over time being an international he's not just a case of a uh, crash merchant but he runs great lines as well and good at scoring tries is he looking for a bit of redemption, Danny? Because his last World Cup ended with a red card against Samoa in Japan and he got a lot of stick for that and he's had a couple of red cards since. But do, do you think this is his opportunity to put a real mark down on the, uh, on the World Cup? I do, yeah. And it, I, I really believe that it'll come down to that uh, third game against South Africa. I, I, I think he's going to be huge himself and that partnership with um, Robbie Henshaw in the midfield if they're barring any injuries. That's an incredible partnership that was first brought down in Connacht. Um, and uh, hopefully that, that will continue. Second player on the squad, Alan, is Mac Hansen. He's a man of multiple tattoos and a hundred different haircuts. Um, but that's only the tiny bit of him because when this guy steps over that white line a different person arrives he only came here two years ago he has made some uh, impact on Connacht and Ireland oh, he certainly has if you, if you look at his record he's played 16 times for Ireland has never been substituted has played 80 minutes of every one of them games and scored seven tries in those 16 games and he's won 15 of them he's been on the winning side 15 times that's an amazing record for a guy who's come out of nowhere um, you know like even with his try scoring record for Connacht he scores a try one every three games so this guy is just a phenomenal so he can do whatever he likes with his hair and his tattoos as long as he keeps doing what he's doing on the pitch and it's not just his try scoring the try he made for um, Gary Ringrose last week with the cross kick was just incredible he pops up all over the place 
he worries defences which gives space then for other players because they're worried about what Mike Hansen is going to do or is capable of doing um, and himself and James Lowe when they're, they're put together a, a phenomenal pairing on the wing um, so he's, he's just a genius is basically what I'd say yeah, look, it's an interesting story how he came here, but what's also interesting is about Ireland. He came to Connacht and Andy Farrell rang Andy Friend and said, uh, tell me about this guy. This was after he scored that try against one of the South African sides where he beat about nine defenders and went about 45 metres. Mm. And you just thought, OK, this guy's different. Um, so he's just kicked on it. You know, a year after he arrived here, he was part of a team winning a 2-1 series in New Zealand. and you're, you're, You couldn't write that script, could you? But no. you have to have ability before you, you get to that, when you get to that level. You do, you do. And if you look at the fact that if you go back to the game we lost, was the game against France in Paris. France had just scored their, their try after being 3-0. So they were 10-0 up and they were absolutely dominating Ireland. And then he pulled the ball out of the air from the kickoff, which is still one of the greatest tries I've ever seen. And it completely changed the momentum of the game. And Ireland could have won that game. And so he's, he's not just highly talented and a bit of a genius. He's a big-time player. When the big stuff comes, he's there. He's going to score tries. He's going to be there when needed in the big matches. Finally, the third person, third player that's on this on the plane yesterday uh, Dave Finn Finley Beelham tell me about him he's uh, he was around the houses a little bit to start with I think he was at he was at Leinster or Munster and then he went to Ulster then he came here he found a home here but he's just got better and better now maybe props get better with age but this guy has come on leaps and bounds in the last two seasons I mean if you consider when he first got here he was probably fourth fifth choice and at that point, for some reason, Connacht has always been very capable of producing tight heads who end up getting gap for Ireland. I think for some reason it is disproportionately the position where Connacht players will get capped. But I think if, if you're looking when in that first few seasons when Finney came here, he wasn't necessarily the most obvious person to be capped. But the, the idea, he has improved exponentially for the last, every season for the last five years. I would argue he's more important for certain games. I think he's going to be more important in the South Africa game uh, than Tyke Furlong will be. Because Tyke Furlong will give you 60 minutes hard grunts. But as we've seen with South Africa, with their tendency to bring on the bomb squad, there's an argument to be said that the team, the front row that finishes for South Africa is better than the front row that starts, which means that Finlay is probably going in against the top, he's probably going in against Stephen Kitsoff, which later down the line is going to be a domestic feature. And I think Steve, I think Finlay, three, four years ago, could not have held his own with the likes of Kitsoff uh, and, and those, types of, those types of brutal, scrummaging, tight head, loose heads. But not only... Not only is he, is he, has, has he improved as a ball-playing player, I mean, we tend to forget he gave the, one of the best assists in the Six Nations for Hugo Keenan. But his scrummaging is immense. And I think, weirdly, I think he's a better scrummaging tight head at this moment in time than Tyg Furlong is. And I think that's going to be huge, given what we know South Africa will do. There are another 30 players involved. We won't be able to go through all of them and we will be coming back for an absolutely in-depth look in the second part of our, build, our, our preview show about the Ireland's group. But one player didn't make the plane so far, which was a little bit of a surprise, was Kean Prendergast. We've been watching this guy since he came in to Connacht and there was an immediate view that this guy was operating at maybe a slightly different level. Uh, I'll go back to Danny on that one. What, what do you feel was the decision that they didn't bring him because he was on the plane and then he didn't get the boarding pass? Uh, I don't think it was anything that he did himself. I actually think it might be... Uh, we're bringing five centres. I think there might be a couple of injuries there that they're looking to cover. Um, so I don't think it's actually anything down to what Keane did because I thought he was superb um, playing at eight. Like uh, they've they've thrown him in there a couple of times for Connacht this season, and he he kind of struggled. And I thought at the international stage he had a big opportunity to really kind of put his hand up, and he didn't look out of place. He he was giving us go forward ball. He was doing superbly well for a guy that had only played eight uh, and only a handful of times for Connacht. Uh, he's a very determined and uh, aggressive uh, player. 
and I, I, I think he's very, very unlucky not to go. Caelan Blade, Alan is also a local player who might have been pretty close um, as a reserve scrum half and I would suggest that himself and Prendergast will be pushing through and working, you know, they're going to be training as if they were with Ireland in some ways and they're only once a medical happens, yeah. they're on a plane. Yeah, as soon as there's an injury, we're going to see we're going to see Caelan, assuming there is a, an injury. But the, the problem for Caelan is that scrum halves don't tend to get injured very often, unfortunately. Um, and, and Ireland it's have... Fortunate for them. <laughs> fortunate for them, yeah. Well, unfortunately, from, from uh, Caelan's point of view. But you, you just never know. You know, um, Conor Murray's got a lot of miles on the clock and it wouldn't take a whole hell of a lot for him to sort of go down and get an injury and that's that's part of the problem for some of these players the older players is that they can pick up a niggle and because they're older they don't they don't fix quite as quickly and the world cup's quite short so yeah every chance he might get out there do you think conor murray is going as a potential starter or do you think he's going as a finisher to come off the bench and close out games because they they use him in that role pretty regularly so are they yeah. really looking at Casey and uh, Gibson Park as your starters and Murray's there to, to come on to close out? That, that's what I would expect, you know, from the point of view that he can, he can change the pace of the game. He can play quickly if he needs to, but his ability to read the game, he's like having an extra defender on the field, so if they need to close out a tight game, he's like an extra back row. He's a big man. He's six foot two, six foot three. He's he's a, a really strong tackler. So from the point of view of you know, for instance, the South Africa game, you'd want someone of his size coming on to handle their their big lads when they're coming off the bench. Um, right. Let's take our first pool analysis, and we're going to go to Danny for this one because he's doing pool A now. In pool A, we have France, New Zealand, Uruguay, Italy, and Namibia. Namibia. Have played 22 games in the World Cup and have never won one. And Italy have never beaten a Tier 1 nation. Uh, Uruguay haven't either. And you got to be honest, it's about France and New Zealand. But Danny, what's happening? Yeah, it is. I'll, I'll, I'll start at the bottom. Um, I'll start with Namibia. They, they hold some very unwanted records. Um, they, they, they hold the record of the uh, largest winning or uh, losing margin of 142 to nil against Australia which is not great um, they also uh, they, they, they also hold a uh, bad re- record of um, one of five teams to have conceded a thousand points at the World Cup like you know it, it, everything's up against them they're going to be looking for their first win possibly against Uruguay but they've lost um, they've only won of the last one, one game of the last three against Uruguay that's going to be their big chance to get it um, I'll jump on to Uruguay the Los Teros um, they had a big, big moment in the last World Cup uh, where they beat Fiji, um, and it was amazing. And I, and I remember watching that game, and everyone was on on board with them. But I'm not sure that they're, they're going to get the same swung, song, swung, uh, song, song. Sorry, I'll move on. Uh, same, same kind of story this this uh, this time around. I don't feel like they're going to be anywhere near to Italy, and then it's all going to be down to um, New Zealand and Fran- France. But Italy, uh, 13th in the world. Um, I really feel like they're going to be looking for third in that group. They're they're going, to, they're going to get the two wins against Uruguay and Namibia, but I just don't see them getting anywhere near uh, New Zealand or France. Um, I know the, the, the two big ones, uh, and to be honest, I feel like if you if you asked everybody in Murty Rabbits here, you'd get a 50-50 split of who's going to top the pool and who's not, and I think it's going to come, it's going to come down to that first game where I think New Zealand are going to win. Um, there, there's too many things going against France at the moment with another player uh, dropping out. Um, yeah, the, just tell us, who, who have they lost? They've, they've just lost Paul Willemse today. They've lost... Um, uh, Entomac, uh, they're they're both gone for the whole uh, World Cup. Uh, Cyril Bali is out for the first two games, and they've also lost um, Dante for the for the opener. And he's huge for France. He's play he started uh, 13 of the last 20 games for for France, and they've won all of them when he started. So he's he's a he's a big game, a big player to lose. So that's the first game of the World Cup next Friday night. Come in here to Murty's and watch it. Kicks off at uh, 8 p.m. Irish time. It's going to be a cracker. Uh, last Friday evening, uh, I was in here doing an event with the Connacht Clan, the supporters group. We were um, interviewing Mary Healy, who was one of the two recipients of the Hall of Fame. But while it was going on, something quite uh, outrageous was happening in Twickenham. New Zealand were playing South Africa in allegedly a warm-up game. Uh, it finished New Zealand 7, South Africa 35. 
That's the biggest defeat that New Zealand have ever had in rugby. That is some thought. They were 28-0 down at one stage. Uh, it caused ructions because South Africa decided to stick seven uh, players on the bench who were forwards and one lone back. Um, it really has shook up where this competition is and these two teams are in the same part of the draw. So I caught up with Brendan Nell. Uh, he's been on Galway Bay with us last year broadcasting live from Pretoria. Um, the Craggy Rugby podcast uses them as well. So let's have a listen to what he had to tell me earlier in the week about that win and where he sees the World Cup going. Brendan Nell in Johannesburg, good evening. Welcome to Galway Bay FM. Uh, great to be back with you guys. It's getting closer, Brendan. Now, we could spend the next 20 minutes to half an hour talking about West Ham being top of the Premiership <laughs> and uh, As we all the exciting things that's happening there, but I've been tasked with something different tonight. And what's getting closer is the Rugby World Cup. What's the feeling like in South Africa at the moment? Uh, I think there's a lot of excitement, especially um, especially after what happened at Twickenham on Friday night. Uh, yeah, there, there's. I think there, if there was a bit of doubt, there's a lot more belief, and uh, you know, especially with with the tough draw that the boxer have, I think people uh, really feel around you yeah, that uh, yeah, they've got all the tools to make it. So um, it might not be as daunting as we thought maybe six months ago. Yeah, that was that was some performance, all right. It's um, uh, as I say, we were at an event uh, in Murphy Rabbits that night, so we were half watching it, but it did look. A very dominant display. It's obviously got the juices flowing in South Africa. In New Zealand, they're trying to explain it away that they weren't acclimatised and the referee and all the rest of it. But 35-7 is a hiding. Yeah, it's the biggest defeat New Zealand's ever had in their history. I mean, if that... If that listen, we've been on the wrong end of a couple of defeats in our time, so we, I know how it feels. Um, yeah, and, and you do try and make the excuses. You do try and look for the silver linings. And yes, the All Blacks are a quality side. They can easily bounce back and... Yeah, it'd be, be much better next time they and I expected some sort of backlash from them. But saying that, yeah, you, know, you can't take anything away from that that performance. That was the Springboks at their best, at their most dominant. Their scrum was awesome. They 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 cut off all oxygen for the All Blacks. Um, and when a box packs in that sort of mood, um, I, I'd say there's no team in world rugby that probably can contain them. The trick's going to be to do that eight weeks in a row in, in the World Cup. And I think that's daunting for any team. Yeah, look, it's it's a long tournament. And talk to me about the return of Saya Khaleesi. How that's got a lot of uh, media attention here. How, how much of a of a talisman is he for that side? He's huge. Um, and I think anybody who has been close to the Bob team would would understand. He's he's more than just a captain. I mean, he's one of those sort of generational figures. And I mean. People around the world know how good he is in terms of being a statesman and a leader for South Africa. But just, you know, the way he sort of you know, gets that team together and the way they sort of play for each other under him uh, is certainly something special. And, and, you know, that's why the box made it quite clear earlier in the season that if he didn't make it back uh, via injury, uh, from his injury, that uh, he would be going to the World Cup even as, you know, part of the management team because they believe is that that's important for them. There's also been a, a fair bit of discussion up here, Brendan, about the 7-1 bench, and a lot of people are very uh, unhappy with this. And maybe how it came about, because it was 6-2, and then Willie LaRue got injured, and rather than put in a back, <laughs> they put in another forward. Has that registered at all in South Africa, that people are saying, you know, safety issue, you can't really be bringing on a complete new pack of players. Uh, I don't I don't I don't think you get any complaints here in South Africa. I think yeah, you know, we we've known and, and they I would say probably the Russi Jock and uh, Ninaba so the combo came through there. Uh I could see I could probably see them in, in, in a team meeting saying, Why should we go with a back? You know, why 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 not put Quacha Smith who who's played sevens rugby and, and and is basically a hybrid player, you know, why don't we put somebody like him in and see if it works? And there's a lot of risk in it. And that's where I, yeah, I, I see all these articles and I see all these sort of comments coming from some of the pundits about this. And, and yeah, I can't understand it. From the South African point of view, we look at it this way. After the 2019 World Cup, when they demolished England in that final and the pack demolished them and the bomb squad 
sort of was legend was born. Yeah, you know, we heard Eddie Jones and a bunch of other people saying, oh, no, they, they should change the substitutes. And now South Africa has evolved again. And now we're hearing the same story. So, yeah, for us, it's actually, yeah, we quite enjoy scr- seeing our scrum dominate like that. We quite enjoy the physical stuff here in South Africa. So uh, it's, it's quite nice for us to see that. And, and the awesome experience of, of of dominating an all black team and then bringing on seven forwards at the same time is something <laughs> you've know, never seen in rugby before. And then, and yeah, if you're on the receiving on end of that, I'm sure you're going to complain, but yeah, to me, bottom line, it's innovation and anything innovative in rugby should be, yeah, it should be praised, not, not, yeah, sort of yeah, downtrodden. And um, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to happen often. I think it's a huge risk. And it could easily have backfired, but hey, why not? If it works and you can do it, you've got the pack, go for it. South Africa are in the group of death. I suppose every World Cup of, doesn't matter whether it's cricket or rugby or hockey or soccer, there's always one group that sort of stands out. And, and this is an interesting one. You've got Ireland, Scotland, South Africa, Romania and Tonga. And only two of those teams can make the quarterfinals, even though they're all... You know, there's a lot of sides there in, in the top top five. Does South Africa have a bit of an advantage, Brendan? They're playing Scotland first. Then they play Romania, who they're going to thump. And then they play Ireland. Whereas Ireland go in and they play Romania first and then Tonga. And then they've got a massive game against South Africa. Whereas you've actually had a pretty hard workout against Scotland, you would think. I, th- I think so, and I think uh, that's one thing. So, Rossi and Jock have both been, for the last couple of months, sort of uh, hammering down the fact that everyone talks about them in Ireland, but their big game is Scotland, because if you lose against Scotland, then your whole World Cup's upside down, uh, and you need to, and you start panicking about making out of the pool. Um, but, you know, to me, I, I think I think they've, they've prepared pretty well. I, I think they, they know they've got a hard pool. They know what they're in for, and they know that that they, if they're in form, they can they can beat all these all these teams in their group. Uh, you know, I mean, Ireland are obviously going to be the favourites, being the number one side in the world. Although they almost lost that ranking this weekend, and if I was them, I'd be a bit worried because yeah, all the pressure will be on them. Uh, the Springboks, yeah, are quite enjoying this at the moment, and the, I think yeah, I sort of had a chat to one or two of the management members last year after they. Yeah, after they lost to Ireland in Dublin and lost to France at 14 men, and they both came back and they and they both of the guys I spoke to said to me, "Well, we expected a lot more of a challenge, even though we lost the game. Um, we know what we have to do now for the World Cup." And uh, yeah, they were they were quite quite adamant that if they can get the Bok team right, they'll be fine on the day. And I I think Friday night at Twickenham showed us where they're going with this. Uh, there's a lot more depth in that box squad at the moment. Uh, there's a lot less of a difference between first and second choice players at the moment. And uh, yeah, I think I think Ireland are the ones. In fact, I would be very worried if Ireland if they do lose against South Africa, Scotland could be a huge banana peel for them. Yeah, that's my thought as well. Um, Scotland always put up a good display against Ireland. They they tend not to win very often, but yeah, that that is such a pressure game. Um, Ireland's warm-up has been okay-ish. There's been a few good bits of play and there's been some pretty poor stuff. Do you think, again, the fact that South Africa came through, even though it was a reduced rugby championship, that that is, again, they've been playing competitive rugby, whereas Ireland haven't played maybe a full-on game since last March? Well, I think it does It does make a difference. And I know coaches will always you know, back their own sort of preparation, say it's the right one. But you know, in South Africa, there's very much a belief that if you're going to play the best, you've got to beat the best at the World Cup. You might as well be used to that standard. And and I think what we've seen of Ireland, they, I mean, okay, England haven't really been impressive. So I'm not quite sure how, how much to put into that one. But yeah, you would think that games like the, the French and New Zealand and those type of those are the top teams you're going to play at the World Cup. So that's the type of level you want. Um, yeah, scraping home against Samoa would have me worried. Samoa are that type of team. Tonga can also be a, a, a big banana peel. I remember in 2007, the Springboks almost lost to them. If there was one ball that, if it, at the end of the game, in Lance, that if it, if, if it bounced in, it could easily have been an upset for the Springboks. So, um, yeah, th- those teams tend to grow extra legs at the World Cup. Uh, Ireland definitely have the depth. They have the they have the players. They have the system. Um, and if they get everything right, they're going to be very tough to beat as well. But um, I think the box will quite enjoy that. And the, 
I, I can see uh, Ireland getting out, but if, if if they lose, if they if they struggle against the box, I think Scotland's going to be a very tough game for them. Moving on and just having a look around the rest of the the World Cup, who do you think stands out, and who do you? I, I'm guessing you think South Africa are going to win, but who do you think would be up there with a real chance? Yeah, I think. I think. Look, I mean, I'm I'm not bold enough. I, I obviously always back Springboks being a South African, but uh, yeah, for me, for me, this is this is going to be a marathon. It's going to be you're going to need a lot of luck uh, going going your way. You're going to need discipline because if if a red card could end everybody's World Cup, and, and we we saw how cards have influenced games in the last couple of weeks. So uh, yeah, if you get a red card, that could be the end of your World Cup, no matter how well you play. So um, I think that's going to be the huge thing. Uh, <clears throat> I think um, also yeah, it comes down to those moments and who takes the right decisions in those moments. France are, along with Ireland, obviously favourites being at home. They've got the best squad. Um, yeah, they, they look in awesome form. Uh, but yeah, in 2007, we saw uh, that, that French squad succumb to the pressure. And um, it's going to be a difficult one for them. They definitely on home soil they have everything going for them. I, I could also, yeah, to me, I wouldn't write off England or Australia just because they've got a very easy draw. Um, and and if you if you get out of your pool and you start building momentum, yeah, you can you can get into a semi final and then you can just have that one or two games that takes you through. I don't think they're good enough at the moment to win the tournament, but they can, yeah, sort of get there and thereabouts just because the draw is so favourable to them. Um, and you, you never know what the other half of the draw sort of picks up in terms of injuries and cards. Uh, but it's going to be a very interesting World Cup. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very different World Cup. There's no no easing into it. We have big games from, from day one on the World Cup. So, um, yeah, looking forward to it. What's the view in South Africa stroke Southern Hemisphere? That This is the, the referees, the, the TMOs, the, the bunkers, there's going to be a lot of pressure on them as well because um, player safety is a huge issue. Uh, it's a big stage. It's it's going to be pretty. It's going to be full on, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's. I think that's everybody's worry at the World Cup. Every single nation has probably got that worry at the moment. Um, yeah, you look at it. The, the last couple of weeks have only heightened that worry with everything that happened with Owen Farrell and the whole circus around that. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, rugby has this uncanny ability of shooting itself in the foot and making a, something that should be a small issue, you know, making it into a huge, huge issue as well. And um, yeah, for some reason, they keep on doing that. So uh, I think I think bottom line there though is is that the TMOs uh, and, and they're going to be under pressure. So you should rather, if you're a team, try to not give that sort of picture to them, but. Yeah, rugby is a collision game. It's easy to those moments happen very quickly, and uh, you can only hope that they take the right decisions. Because if you get a wrong decision, your team goes out of the World Cup. That's four years down the drain, and uh, yeah, I think it'd be sad if anybody goes out of the World Cup like that. And at the moment, uh, yeah, the laws really make for for that sort of situation. Final question, Brendan. Any potential outsiders? I'm thinking maybe a Fiji. Does the tournament need somebody in the, the last eight that's not from the regular top 10? Because think, there's an awful, an awful lot of games are played and you tend to finish up with the same teams in the quarterfinals. Do we actually need to see somebody else get in through now to, to stir it up a bit? I think we definitely do. and I, I mean, I'd love to see one or two upsets. And that's certainly set up on the other side of the draw for one or two upsets. Uh you look at a team like Georgia who'd beaten Wales. I mean, there's definitely they've definitely got the the opportunity there. Fiji, Samoa, even Tonga have got the opportunity to cause an upset somewhere along the line. Um, whether they will, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think in a way, probably what happened in these warm up games is probably the worst thing for them is is they put everybody on alert. Fiji definitely have put everybody on alert, and yeah, the, the, there will be a lot of people taking them a lot more seriously now. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, the last World Cup we had Japan uh, and they were in 2015. We had them, obviously, with that huge win against the Springboks. So, um, yeah, that, that you need a team like that to, to capture people's imagination, especially outside the traditional uh, rugby you know, places. So I, I'd love it if one of those Pacific Island nations get through. I, I really would. 
Uh, they play a brand of rugby that's so exciting to watch and yeah, so difficult to defend against. So, um, yeah, I, I think we do need it. Whether we'll get it, though, I'm not so sure. All right, lads. Um, that was Brendan Nell, good friend of ours. Uh, he's uh, he's pretty he's pretty confident there, isn't he, Alan? He's kind of purring down in Johannesburg. Well, he is. He's also putting pressure on the referees. He's putting pressure on Ireland. He's putting pressure on France. But he wasn't putting any pressure on South Africa. He just expects them to go and win, um, which is fair enough. Like he, you know, he's every right, especially after they did what they did to to New Zealand um, uh, last week. So yeah, they they're they're very confident about how they go about what they do and, and they have every reason to like they have won the World Cup a couple of times and they've been um, and they are the current world champions so you know there is a reason why he's confident <laughs> um, and you can understand it but it's it's. Uh, I love I loved the psychology of putting all the pressure on everybody else but never mentioning pressure in the same sentence as South Africa Danny it's they have great faith in their uh, the way they play they don't question the way they play they're, they're absolutely on it um, what do you see listening to that and just watching them last week and the fact yeah they are they are the world champions yeah they are and uh, it is funny how they said that there is no pressure I think there's more pressure on South Africa than there is Ireland yes Ireland are number one ranks but that doesn't mean anything they're the holders they're the, they're the current world champions everyone is going to be going after them um, but I do feel about the, the way South Africa play I think you could get in a time machine and go 100 years in the future and they'll still be playing the same way um, they're, they're just they're built for that they're always big monstrous men and they back themselves because um, well I, I love the um, I wouldn't say it's arrogance I feel, I'd say it's confidence and it's like they all breed that and but it comes from a, a very early level I've played with a few South Africans and there's never a doubt in their mind that they can run through somebody or cut somebody in two they just believe it and it's built into them from a very young age is that part of our problem here Dave that we just don't have that sometimes we don't believe it, believe and South Africa even if they're playing badly uh, believe they're playing well or they give the feeling of that yeah um, they thought they were going to win the uh, Pro 14 this, uh, the, the URC this year and they didn't so um, I just found that unbelievably obnoxious I really did I found that obnoxious they are they played seven forwards last week um, unless they plan to put kits off at 10 or put Peter Steff the toy out in the wing they are very cl- this is very close to all falling apart for them they assume they're not going to get injuries they assume that they're going to be able to batter people and it's very, very it's, it's a tight rope and when it goes wrong they will blame the referee they will blame the slope on the pitch they will blame the rain the lack of rain the length of the glass it's never actually you approach the game wrong they are beatable I think Scotland could do a job on them. He's saying all the pressure goes on Ireland if they lose to South Africa, um, then there's pressure on Scotland. Why can't Scotland beat South Africa and put all the pressure on South Africa? Be- because they never have. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a first time for everything. Japan had never beaten them, and they uh, they bet them in the World Cup. South well, Africa... I, I would say when Japan beat them, South Africa were actually trying to play a bit of rugby, and they soon gave that up. Well, if you look at you know the whole thing about 7-1... Forward. I, I can see them going 8-0 and, and to be honest I think I hope they do because nah, they the win. old saying is forwards win matches and backs win uh, decide by how much so if you've got two packs who can win a game why not play two packs and win the game it doesn't matter if you win by a point like, or, or 10 points again I come back to yeah because Stephen Kitzhoff can play scrum half and Peter Steph the can play out half but if the opposition don't have the ball Dave because your pack is keeping the ball and won't let them have it it really doesn't matter I'm, uh, no I find I find the South Africans obnoxious to the nth degree they are the one team I really want to see beaten and not win the World Cup and that is I, I, you're not going to give this me otherwise 8 0 7 0 6 2 I think the sooner they introduce a rule and it needs to happen quickly and I've been amazed by other people this week you can have 15 players on the bench. You can only pick five. They're the only ones that can come on. That is a rule that needs to be introduced. Yeah, I'd like that. I, I like that idea. But I, I, I also think that, you know, they, they get a slightly bad rap about their size. Chelsea Colby's not the biggest man in the world. And he's probably one of the most exciting rugby players in the world. Um, the Pimpy is the same. Not exactly a big man and a fabulous player. Um, the lad that got injured last week, same thing. You know, the, yeah, I, they, I, they, I, they have a lot of really good, highly talented players. And Manny Libok is one of the best out halves in the world. 
when he's not under pressure. Yeah, well, Connacht found that out in the semi-final, didn't they? Because they didn't get enough pressure on him. If you can get in his face, I think they'll go 6-2. I think Ireland will go 6-2 uh, against South Africa. And I think there's a very good chance they might even go 6-2 against Scotland because that's how you beat Scotland. You beat mm. them up. Um, yeah, I think they're... I think they are under pressure actually a little bit South Africa because they're the world champions and that win over New Zealand was very impressive but they had problems dealing with New Zealand a few weeks earlier in New Zealand yeah well exactly like you're talking about playing away from home and they're playing away from home now it's, it's always quite different and that's one of the issues Ireland might have is that yes they're on one of their best ever winning streaks but most of those games were played in Ireland same for South Africa a lot of their the wins have been at home now this was in England with a lot of support in England they'll have similar support in, in France because a, a lot of South Africans play rugby in France so again they'll have the locals who will be picking up on the fact that they're, they're there and, and they do play good rugby at the same time uh, they're, they're at some point they're going to have to play France at some point in this tournament they're going to have to play France and I, when that happens they will not have the crowd um, I, I still think they are one injury away from collapsing and I think it's allowed half I think if Libok gets injured or Libok has a bad game and his confidence goes yeah, that might play in Henry Pollard, but ha- Libot would have to get injured for that to happen. I think there is issues. With will, you, will you Ragu could probably step in there and do a decent enough job, no, especially I, behind a pack I, like that. I'm going to state this now. I think South Africa will not make the final. Fair enough. Okay, that's that's an that's an early statement of intent here. I am, will tell you, lads, all this has been recorded, and <laughs> it will be replayed to you at a later date in the World Cup. Now that's. Uh, We'll be back talking about South Africa in a while because they are, they are still involved in where we're going to be because our group will be coming down. But it's time now to have a look at Pool C. Pool C is, um, well, to explain something to people, the draw for this uh, World Cup was made uh, three years ago. Uh, let that sink in. Three years ago, you make the draw for the pool stages of a World Cup. Uh, that three years ago, we were all we wouldn't. Well, we might have just about been in Murty's, or we probably would have been sitting outside because we were in the middle of COVID. But Pool C, which would be a completely different pool now, but there's no point going there, is Wales, Australia, Portugal, Fiji, and Georgia. Uh, and this has the potential. If Ireland's pool is the pool of death, this could be the pool of chaos. And uh, Alan it certainly will. Right. Alan's, Alan's been researching this one. What do you got to tell us? Well, you're looking at a situation where the the current favourites to win the pool are Australia at four to nine on. They are ranked two places behind Fiji. Second favourites are in the world rankings. Second favourites are Wales at thirteen to five, who are placed one place behind, or two places. Sorry, three places behind Fiji, who are the tenth in the world. Fiji are up to seventh in the world after their win over England, um, and are six to one to win the pool. And I've had a little nibble at that because you're looking at a situation where Fiji have not lost a game this season and beating. That last week for the first time ever, they've got their their coach uh, is um, Simon Ralui, who's uh, currently the joint head coach of Stade Francais and was the general manager in Racing Metro while when they were on their big winning streak a couple of years back. These pe- these guys know what they're doing. They also have someone, you know, you're looking at the star player to me is, Le- is uh, Levani Bottia. He's a former prison officer, which I hadn't realised <laughs> only when I did it. But he's played for La Rochelle. He's played 174 times, scoring 37 tries. But he started on the wing, in the centre and in the back row. And he's done the same for Fiji. This guy is a seriously, seriously talented player. And there's so many other talented players in that Fiji team that I find it mind-boggling that nobody's really giving these guys much of a chance. Well they're looking at their record in the World Cup which is pretty poor it, it, it and is. I know it's, you're trying to sell me this that it's all changed but we haven't we have seen look they beat England I, I'm tempted to say even Italy could have gone and beaten England the way they played that day the thing about Fiji is yes they've had skillful players big players they've had players playing in Europe forever but their World Cup really comes down to winning one game, and that was against Wales in Nantes in 2007. I was at that. It was a fantastic day. But can they put it together game after game in four games? I think so, because you've, you've got a nice mixture of players coming for, to play in Europe, and a lot of them you know, are playing with top-quality clubs in Europe. And the Fiji Drew are now playing against the likes of, of um, the New Zealand provincial teams and beating them. So they're actually playing a lot of quality rugby. 
um, and beating them on, you know, not just once, two or three times. And, you know, so they, they have the capability, they're building in, they're a lot more pragmatic about how they do things. Their scrum is one of the, it's probably the strongest scrum they've ever had. If they can get 50-50 with any Northern Hemisphere team with a scrum, and the same with their lineup, which has improved enormously, they have a real chance. You're also looking at a situation where Australia haven't won a single game this year. No team goes into a World Cup not winning a game expecting, and, and I, I just, just find that nah. mind-boggling. Eddie Jones, Eddie Jones, Eddie Jones, <laughs> Eddie Jones, who's who's gotten rid of, you know, he he's come along, he's he's um, who's he not picked on his team? Like it's 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 phenomenal. He's gone without Michael Hooper, Quade Cooper. He's brought one out half, one out half, um, in Carter Gordon, who's got about nine caps if he has that many. Um, Will Skelton is his captain. He's never captained the team before. Well, he hasn't captained a team since he was a teenager. The, the, the other issue about Will Skelton is that he, he doesn't apparently talk to anybody, so I'm not sure that that's the ideal <laughs> captain. Um, yeah, as I say, the pool of chaos, but, you know, maybe look at Wales. Wales are going in there with an equally bad record, but Wales, you know, Wales have been to World Cup semi-finals. So have Scotland. We've never actually made that. Maybe when they get to a tournament, they will actually manage to pull this together. They might, but they've never gone in with this bad a form. They've won two games in the last eight. One was against Italy. The other was actually against Australia. Now, Wales will fancy themselves against Australia because most people think they always lose to them but Wales have beaten Australia the last three times to play them including in the last World Cup so you're looking at a situation where Wales under Warren Gatland could possibly get the win they need against Australia but possibly lose to Fiji um, but might get out of the group and it could be Australia who are in total chaos they have some fabulous rugby players like Cora Betty is one of the best players in the world Fijian born <laughs> by the way um, Wales are in a, in a similar situation but they have so many of their, their um, experienced players not there anymore that you're looking at the team going you know, we, we watch these guys in the ORC and like what they, they didn't have a team in the top 8 last year so how are they going to go and go to a World Cup when they went to World Cups and when they had those teams they always had world class players I don't see a world class player in that Wales team apart from maybe Louis Rees Samet who is a phenomenal rugby player but he's a winger <laughs> wingers need the ball and I'm not sure Wales will get enough ball to him OK Georgia are the well Portugal are there as well I, I don't know what you can tell me is, is there anything well, well, well Portugal Portugal um, got in um on points difference over the USA so, so they had a repressage tournament and it was only points difference that stopped the USA from being in the World Cup with Portugal it's, and, a, it's and, the uh, second time they've been there they were there in 87 and uh, America as well are captained by uh, Adge McGinty a man who uh, would know Marty Rabbits and would know the sports ground of course absolutely Connacht out half when they won, when they run the Pro 12 but yeah the loss of America they um, very bad on, on uh, aggregate situation the team, and then, and the team, then, yeah, the team that really interests me in here is Georgia. Yeah, I, I was keeping them to the end <laughs> because, again, they don't seem to be up to much. But we know that they are, they are South Af they are the South Africa of Europe. I mean, they yeah. they just play. They want big men everywhere. Well, well, the reason the reason they, their nickname is the the Lelos, and the reason they're, they're called the Lelos is the Lelo is a is a, um, a, a term that means field. And it's a game that they used to play between villages that's dated back to the 12th century where they put a ball in the middle of a field, or effectively a field, between two rivers and two villages took each other on by the, the winners were the ones who got the ball into the opposition stream first. So they've been playing a form of rugby for the last thousand years practically um, not exactly the type we play but you know big men they, they're obviously famous for their wrestling as well but they have won the second tier competition in Europe uh, since 2007 I think they've only lost it once that's that's an enormous they are sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting half their team half their players are playing in France uh, the other half play for the Black Lion Club in, in Georgia they have when they play home games they average something like 57,000 people in the ground it's an enormous game over there they, they just cannot wait to come and uh, to, to get a chance and I think Australia might be the ones who might struggle against them um, now Australia could blow them away but you know 
Georgia there against Scotland last week were winning 6-0 at half time uh, they don't know and they do that on a regular basis they play a half of rugby brilliantly but then don't know how to go to the next level but they do have one player in, in David Ninayashvili who plays for Leon. he scored 9 games 9 tries in the last 20 games he is a class class act serious speed and could be a player to watch OK, we'll be seeing him with Connacht in January, hopefully when we go over there. So at the end of all about this, of the, of, the, of the pool of chaos, who's coming out of it? I think Fiji are going to win the group and I think Wales will come second. You heard it here first, folks. That could be something really special. Um, we're going to play in momentarily our second recording, which was uh, done this morning with... Uh, Oliver Lee, who's uh, a Galway man originally, he's living in uh, Auckland in uh, New Zealand. Obviously, I had a brain fade there as to where Auckland actually is. Uh, we're going to br- we're going to bring that in shortly. But um, just to look at where we are as well in terms of um, how this works out. Is there any concern for? Uh, I'm going to come back to Ireland momentarily. Is um, the fact that there's a two-week break, I'm gonna, you know, b- between that game, that that that's something we, we talked about it briefly earlier. But is, is that a real pressure issue? I don't think so. Um, I think uh, by the time you get to to that break, uh, you, you come off the game of South Africa. I think it's perfectly timed. You guys get back to any kind of injuries and niggles that are picked up. Uh, they'll be back fully ready to go for South, uh, for Scotland um, where people seem to think that it's going to be a, um, a banana, a potential banana skin I don't feel like it will be after that two weeks uh, because I do feel like Andy Farrell has this group really believe in what they're, what they're doing and they're very good at staying say insular and just focusing um, wholly on themselves and getting themselves kind of ready to go yeah, the, situ- the situation with that I suppose Okay, we've queued that one up. We were slightly off pitch there, but we'll we'll talk more about that when we talk about Ireland. This is Oliver Lee. He's a Kilcarran man who runs a very successful magazine publishing basis uh, business in Auckland. But he's also a huge rugby fan. And this is just about how things are in New Zealand, where rugby is in New Zealand, and of course where they are after last week's big defeat at uh, Twickenham. Good evening, Oliver. It's wonderful to have you along here on Galway Bay FM for our preview show to give us a bit of a view from New Zealand. Look, I'm just wondering, are the All Blacks still the obsession in New Zealand that is portrayed up here? Or does not everybody love rugby down there, if you know what I mean? Good evening, William, and all your listeners. I'm delighted to link up with you. And that's an interesting question. To answer your question, rugby, it's, it's not the obsession it was. Rugby public down here, they'll be quietly surprised if in New Zealand uh, win the World Cup. But uh, there'll be a few people thinking that uh, they mightn't even get past the quarterfinal. That's an interesting thing. It's, it's trying to work out the confidence levels. Uh, the defeat in Twickenham uh, recently, biggest defeat in New Zealand rugby history. South Africa, obviously... Bigging that up, New Zealand media may be trying to turn it down a little bit and say it was a warm-up game and it was this and that. But what what is the mood there in terms of maybe the media mood on one side and then the man in the man and woman in the street or the people that go to the games are they are they a bit less enthusiastic maybe than the media? Everybody completely shocked by that result uh, last week. You know, New Zealand were lucky to score a try at the very end. Otherwise, it would have been the biggest uh, defeat. Or New Zealand never have lost a game without scoring points. So the discussion around it here was like they beat. I went to the first game here in Auckland against South Africa, and then I was in Melbourne for the the match against Australia, and I was in Dunedin. So New Zealand played very well against uh, Argentina, then South Africa here. Australia at the MCG in front of 85,000 people and they had a tough game in Dunedin but nobody thought that they'd go to that game in Twickenham last week in front of 86,000. I think there was about 70% of the support there were South African expats and uh, lose it the way they did. And the talking point here this week has been how South Africa brought on nearly a a new forward pack uh, in the second half of the game and uh, people were saying that that's, you know, that's not right, but it's within the rules. And I see Eddie Jones came out yesterday or today and said maybe other teams might do that, but you're you're taking a, a chance by going into a game with only one one back. But look at, I think the 
guys here, ex All Blacks on TV discussions, where uh, put a small bit of blame to refereeing decisions, and it's the adaptation of the laws. And at the moment, across the ditch here, and we've got a team that's flying high. We've got one New Zealand team in the Australian National Rugby League competition. But you compare rugby union to rugby league, and uh, it's a totally different. The game is moving non-stop all the time. Former CEO of New Zealand Rugby uh, came out uh, today and he said he won't watch any of the Rugby World Cup matches. He said the game last week was a disaster. He said it took 120 minutes uh, and he said the ball was only in play for a total of 25 minutes. He thinks the uh, refereeing, and but he's blaming the people that make these laws. And, um, you know, as I said, that first game I saw here in April 89, you know, Auckland had a, a brilliant back line and New Zealand rugby is noticed for the speed of its back line and, and back play and moving the game fast but you know if referees keep pinging them and if players like last week we had two yellow cards and then a subsequent red card for Scott Barrett it can change the whole structure of, of, of the game but Foster came out after that he said thank God that happened last week rather than this night week New Zealand time when they'll play um, France in the opening game of the World Cup just looking forward to that game against uh, France and the whole World Cup. That game will be played, what, it's an early morning game for you, kickoff uh, time there. It's going to be played here at 7.15 on Saturday morning. So, um, obviously, 7.15 in, in the morning. It's not, so people, Kiwis generally get up early. I'm up before that myself, well before it. Uh, so, obviously, a lot of people will be glued to, to their TVs for that. And... Uh, but I look at that and see, right, that's the first game. New Zealand's next big game will be a quarter final. Could be against Ireland, it could be. They've got no opposition for the following three games. They'll put 100 points on Italy. Probably they could put 120 on Uruguay and Namibia. I look at their pool uh, against Ireland's pool, which is the pool of death with South Africa, Scotland, Tonga. Samoa did last week and what Fiji did. I wouldn't be surprised if Tonga could cause an upset and beat uh, could possibly beat Ireland, could beat Scotland. I hope it doesn't happen. But Tonga have eight ex All Blacks and a few ex Wallabies uh, in their group. But at least Ireland, they start with Romania, which they'd hopefully beat, and they play their tough matches leading up to the quarter final. So hopefully Ireland get through, either winning the group or coming second. They'll be well seasoned. Whereas New Zealand won't really have uh, a tough game between the next Saturday, the 9th of September and a quarter-final match on the 15th of October, because you can say what you like, uh, how they'll talk up these other teams, Namibia, Uruguay and Italy. They won't have a hope. Just just finally, Oliver, the, uh, we've, we've talked about what rugby means down there. Will, will the World Cup sort of build up more interest in rugby, or is it a time when people who aren't as interested in the game might follow it? Or... Is it a bit like Wales, where you're either right in on rugby or, as some of my family over there go, they just put their fingers in their ears. They don't want to even listen. It's fascinating in countries where, where rugby is a big sport. Well, speaking of Wales, the, the former CEO of New Zealand, uh, David Moffat, who went on, I think he was the head of Sport Wales for about five years. He said today he won't watch any of the games. He said, as far as he, he sees, rugby is boring. But look, at if New Zealand start doing well, and there's quite a lot of people um, from here travelling over uh, to the World Cup, of course, many of them are going for their last pool game in the quarter and semi-final and, and, and the final. Like, I'll be hoping that uh, New Zealand and Ireland will win their groups and win their quarter-finals and then they'd hopefully meet in a final. That'd be a dream for me and uh, Ireland to win uh, by a point. I think th the New Zealand public down here feel this could be Ireland's year. Uh, or France's year. The neutrals down here feel it would be good to see somebody other than, you know, South Africa, England, but you can rule out England. I don't think they've got a hope in hell. So I think uh, a lot of neutrals down here would love to see Ireland uh, win the World Cup. Um, and of course, it would be a magnificent achievement for uh, Andy Farrell and his team. I think reading some of the stories in the Irish media over the last week, compared to the disastrous um Build up. We had to 2019 World Cup uh, in Japan when we were hammered by England in, in Twickenham. We've got a very good build, uh, build up to this World Cup. Not too many uh, worries on the injury front. Of course, Johnny Sexton, he, he can still play a huge part as long as he stays injury free. Injury free. So hopefully 
we'll see some um, good games. But I think we'll see a few surprises in this particular World Cup. But I think next week, if New Zealand uh, lose to France badly, uh, it'll certainly uh, put a dent uh, in their chances to, to go past the quarter final. Because if uh, South Africa win that group, who will be, they'll be playing New Zealand in, in, in a quarter final. So uh, it's, it's all to play for. But certainly the days are getting long down here. We have the first day of spring today. Uh, our NPC, the National Provincial Championship, is on at the moment. And uh, I certainly love going to live sport. And I went to three of the World Cup uh, soccer games at Eden Park and they were fantastic. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, if, if things went right, this World Cup should have been in Ireland, lads. You know, Ireland had a great chance yeah. to host this. Yeah. And I know a lot of New Zealanders uh, were hoping that Ireland uh, were going to host it. But uh, we probably should have taken the checkbooks out before France did and did a deal with Italy, <laughs> Wales, Scotland. Uh, yeah. And we wouldn't have lost that vote by a point. Well, welcome back to Murdy's. We're getting a little bit of uh, noise now. We've got people involved and uh, they realise we're here. Um, the ultimate rugby venue. Um, they're showing football at the moment, actually, but that's OK, because West Ham are leading 1-0. Uh, and that's made me quite happy. Lads, listening to what Oliver had to say there about the situation in New Zealand, it was great to hear somebody who's left Galway 30 years ago. He's still passionate about Irish rugby. Um, and I, I think Ireland in general, he has a radio show down there. The view coming across there is that things in New Zealand are a bit nervous, they're a bit twitchy. There isn't, um, there isn't that aura about this team any longer. I'm going to jump on that one. It's, um, I guess it's, it's, it's a, you can say that there isn't that aura, but um, we're also looking at the team that has the most wins in the tournament, 49, uh, since, since, the, since the, throughout, throughout the tournament. They're, they're also, um, they've got the three, they've, they're holding it three times. So, like, yes, they might not be in the best of form, and they did lose to South Africa. Like, that's a different game for them. They're, that's, like, one of their biggest rivals. So they'll big that up. But at the end of the day, that doesn't mean anything when it comes to the World Cup. World Cup games are going to be forgotten come uh, next Friday evening. You know, France, New Zealand. Yeah, uh, France, is that New Zealand. a point that Ireland, Danny, have to take on board? Because our warm-up performances, while they've gone unbeaten, haven't exactly... Um, set the world on fire and maybe you don't want to in a warm up game that's how I would feel about it like what, what, what happens if you you do anything in the in the warm ups I remember um, South Africa came, came and played Connacht and you know they nearly lost that game and nothing's ever said about it they went to win the win that, that tournament you know um, nothing's ever everything is forgotten once that first game kicks off uh, any of the warm up games they don't mean anything They're, they are well there's no, no such thing as a friendly in international rugby to me but they, there's no kind of context. Everything that matters is from next Friday in the World Cup. Dave, he made the point, and it has been made in, in other places, that France and New Zealand on the opening weekend, and then New Zealand will play Uruguay, Italy and Namibia, and then they'll go into a quarter final, and they'll also have a lay week where they don't play anybody. That's tricky to handle because they know realistically they're going to win two of those games very easily. Italy never seem to get to grips with them at all. But at the back of their mind, they know that Ireland or South Africa are probably waiting in the quarterfinals. It's, it's an interesting one. Yeah, but it's not like they have known for three years. I mean, New Zealand were like, unlike some of the other teams in this competition, but I would, you know, we need to talk about that, that draw three years ago is still outstandingly a stupid idea. But New Zealand have had three years to prepare for this. It's not something been sprung in there two weeks ago. Whether they are in form, I don't know. I think, weirdly, I say it again, I think New Zealand will learn an awful lot more about after what happens, about themselves after what happened last week than South Africa will. I think, um, I think Danny's right. I think you, there's two things, there's two ways you don't want to go into a World Cup. One is obviously being hockeyed and going in completely out of form. But the other one is going in in a huge amount of form, winning by 30, 40 points, looking really impressive in your warm-up games, because then you peak too soon. I think New Zealand are in a perfect situation. I think they will, loot, they will absolutely target France next week. If it wins, if they win, 
they then use the three games to rest players and rotate players and, and do what they're doing because they've done an awful lot of rotation this year. If they lose, they have three weeks to get it right and then they will use, I hate to say it, they will use Uruguay, Italy, and Namibia as cannon fodder in preparation for whoever they get in the quarterfinal. Yeah, that's a fair that's a fair argument coming back on that as well. It's going to be fascinating to see. I think France will win next week because I just think it means so much to them. Admittedly, they are starting. Players are starting to disappear out of that squad. There's four serious players missing. Two of them are out for the whole tournament. Is that a, a question mark? We won't talk about it now. But the top 14, 26 regular season games, mm. four games minimum in Europe. That's 30 games. That's a lot of hard rugby, let me tell you. And that's, that is a question. Um, we're going to take our final pool preview now before we get stuck into the Ireland pool. So Dave is back on with us. He's in pool D. And pool D is England, who are abysmal, it seems. Argentina, who are maybe getting there. Chile, who are a bunch of amateurs. Samoa, who could, on their day be anything and Japan Japan are the team that have a little bit fallen off the, the, the situation so Dave what, what are you seeing looking at this one well I, first of all if we're going to give names to every group this is going to be the group of red cards the game of red the, cards red cards because okay. there are too many players in all these squads who, who have discipline issues we know the England situation we know where they are or where they're not they are devoid of all confidence they are missing Bortwick's first choice 8, 9 and 10 for at least one game they're missing their 9 and 10 for two games and they're missing their first choice 9 for the entire tournament they are shambolic it, <laughs> weirdly though they only need to win if they win that game against Argentina whoever wins Ar England Argentina is ga I will pretty much certain will make a semi-final because of the vagaries of the draw um the problem is going to be discipline Argentina will take huge confidence from that win back in November uh, they have a kicker in Buffelli who is just a metronome. I think Carreras is Carreras is going to dominate everything. But you look at who you look at who England are bringing on. They take up. They they, they you know England lose their first choice and they're scrambling to replace them. It's something as simple as hooker. You take up one of the best hookers in the world, Julian Montoya, and you bring on Gus Creevy. I mean, that's the depth they have. The Argentinians will be targeting that game, and they will they will know uh, that they are. As you say, Chile, no offence to them. But they have one thing that no other team has, and that is absolute confidence in knowing what the rest of their team will do. Because all bar three of them play, play in... Thanks, Jerry. All bar three of them play in Chile, and, all, and the vast majority play for the one club. So Chile will know what you do, but they are amateur players. They simply will not have the conditioning. They will not have... Um, they will not have the professionalism to cope with the bigger teams. Japan... Japan have fallen off a cliff, you're right, we're coming to the end of the Jamie Joseph. this is probably a World Cup too far, they have an issue, and it's very significant, they lost, they removed one of their locks, uh, one of their experienced locks from the last World Cup because of conditioning issues, the guy they brought in to replace him was then dropped out because he wasn't playing well enough, so they have issues with their help, they simply have suffered from a lack of, their team going out of, of, of Super Rugby was massive, as we saw what happened when we were discussing Fiji and we were discussing um, Samoa as well. They are Japan going out was huge for them. And then you've got Samoa, who on paper, and this is genuinely looking the amount of caps that they have for their country, are probably the least experienced uh, squad in the competition. And then you take a deeper look and you realise that they have got Steve Luatua coming back, they've Charlie Fawamina coming back, Fritz Lee coming back, Ben Lang coming back. They are the team that has benefited along with Tonga the most from the redrawing of the rules, allowing players to go back after three years. So I think Samoa are a very, very big dark horse. They are probably coming to this even more under the radar than they did back in 95 when Pat Lamb uh, took took them to the victory over Wales and took them to the quarterfinals of the World Cup. The way England are playing right now, if they take Samoa lightly, they will lose. It is not impossible, though I do think it's unlikely that uh, Samoa could get out of the group simply because I think England will panic and get over the line horribly. But my view is that Argentina will beat England next week. England will win the other three games. They'll be scared to death by, by Samoa. Japan could do something. And Chile will do some, will score a try and will bring down the house. Uh, thank you for that summation. Yeah, look, it is interesting. Um, there's some big games next weekend. New Zealand play France. Scotland play South Africa. Wales play uh, Fiji. So, and then England play Argentina. Ireland have a much simpler start. They play... Uh, Romania, we'll come back to that in a minute but 
if England lose to Argentina, they are staring down a barrel because they should beat Chile and on current form they should beat Japan but I think they have huge problems with Samoa I think the Samoan physicality Ireland remember had problems that was the game Bundiaki was sent off in 2019 was against Samoa they they are very hard to shift off the ball Alan Oh, they are, and, and if you look at the Ireland game last week in the warm-up again, I know it's only a warm-up game, but Ireland struggled with the physicality of Samoa, and, and so you're looking at England, it's probably suit them a little bit, they like, they like to play the, the, the Leicester way, the way that Steve Bortwood likes to play, a dominant type of game, but I think Samoa might give them a lot more issue than they, they realise, and, and especially if they have lost Argentina, that means they're playing there, you know, England will be going into that game under an unbelievable cloud. Um, and it'll be very difficult and like when you hear them talking about when you hear George Ford talking about the fact that they're not training well I've never ever heard a professional rugby player talk about <laughs> not training well it's just totally unheard of so I don't think things are very happy in that camp No, that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting admission it's something that you wouldn't expect in those situations that's an in-house thing mm-hmm, Absolutely um, And of course he's probably concerned because he, you know Farrell is back uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for England is, is, is hard to determine. He's, he's going to miss the first two games or the first game? Yeah, first two. First two. Well, you see, George Ford is under the pressure because he's got to step up now and mm-hmm. his performance last week against Fiji was nothing to write home about. It's, th- this is why this competition does change and it is different because you're seeing the regular teams that we see in the Six Nations, players we see in the URC, or the Premiership or the Top 14. Suddenly they're seeing players that we don't see that often. Mm. Danny, how much difference does that make when you're doing your analysis to get yourself into position? Because these days they analyse the way the grass grows. Oh yeah, they, 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 they analysed everything. Uh, guys guys get analysed to, to from even down to the way they, they sidestep, everything like that. And probably one of the reasons why um, Southern Hemisphere have done so well for so long is that they, they just defend differently the defend where the ball is not with a man so do, do some more sidestep Danny I, uh, that's a bit of an odd one for them some of them do there, there's the, the man from La Rochelle uh, Sinetti I, I want to say his name I completely could have botched that but um, he's fabulous at 13 like you just have to go back and look at uh, the try that he scored against Leinster just before half time he, it looked like he was going to go out and then he was going back in and he just walked in as if and nobody touched him because they didn't know where he was going yeah, or but, what he was going to do yeah but but that was the referee's fault according to Johnny Sexton <laughs> uh, it's absolutely nothing to do with his skill whatsoever we've gone through the three groups that don't involve Ireland we'll quickly go back and say group A Danny you looked after it you're saying France and New Zealand out of there yeah, uh, New Zealand to top it. Okay, Pool B is Ireland. Pool C, Alan, you... Fiji and Wales, I think Australia will get knocked out. Uh, it will be the first time they, will never, they won't have got out of the pool. Okay, and Dave, what do you reckon in Pool D? I'm going to go Argentina, England, but it will depend on which team keeps 15 players on the pitch longest next weekend. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. That, that, and i tell you something, that could be right. Uh, Samoa, red cards... Japan will always uh, apologise profusely when they get a card of any description. It's uh, when the player bows to the referee and to the other player and then tr- trots off. Uh, it's time for our final play out. This is BBC Radio Scotland's Tom English. Um, he's a friend of the, the Craggy Rugby podcast. He's a very good friend of Galway BFM over the years. He covers everything. When he's not winding up, uh, Glasgow Celtic supporters uh, he's dealing with rugby or he's having a go I think this week he was so busy with the two Ryder Cup teams being announced or potentially so I caught up with him when he was driving his car between Glasgow and Edinburgh it was hands free just in case anybody's worried but you might well hear the odd uh, little bit of car noise but uh, what he has to say is very interesting because he is very very direct in what he has to say Tom, good evening in Edinburgh. Uh, thanks for coming on to the Galway Bay FM preview show for the, the World Cup. So the first question is very simple. What's the mood in Scotland? They're in Ireland's group, so uh, what's the vibe over there, do you think? Um, I think positive but realistic. Um, they've enjoyed what they've seen from the Scotland team in the four matches three wins and a pretty thrilling defeat 
against the first choice France and Saint Etienne. They're playing a lot of good rugby that night. France, Scotland did. So I think um, I think the team is in a good place. There's no real injuries to speak of. They're scoring lots of tries. They're playing lots of good rugby. But they're in this beastly group, and that's the that's the reality. That's when the Scottish feel good kind of hits the wall because. I'm not sure. Has there been a tougher group in the history of the World Cup? I'm not sure there has been. It's savage. But they're in, broadly, they're in a good place. Yeah, I called it the group of death on a podcast the other day. I mean, they're in every World Cup cricket, rugby, hockey has groups of death, football. But this one, <laughs> this is the group of death. It's it's a nonsense how it's worked out, but it, pe- teams have to deal with it. Um, were you surprised how hard both the sides, France and Scotland, went in that warm-up game. I, that was almost like a, a World Cup full-on game rather than a warm-up. Not really, because I think, you know, it's particularly for Scotland, they have South Africa first up. So there's no... Oh, it's different. The dynamic of Scotland's World Cup group is the, the, the way they run of games is different to Ireland. Ireland can not quite ease themselves into it, but they've got two softer games to begin with. Scotland start with South Africa, so they have to be battle hardened and at fever pitch from day one. So I'm not surprised that Scotland. All of Scotland's games are pretty intense. Gregor Townsend said he was going to do this. He said he was going to pick. Uh, partnerships to to kind of bring cohesion because one of the lessons the lessons of four years ago when they really didn't turn up on the opening game against Ireland and Tokyo was the team wasn't really cohesive this time they should be I don't think uh, lack of familiarity with partnerships and stuff like that is going to be a problem against South Africa I think South Africa is going to be the problem against South Africa and how do you think then Ireland match up against them looking at it from a distance you're you're over in Scotland there you obviously keep a very tight eye on Irish rugby but do you feel Ireland are in, in a better position to take on the, the box yeah I do because Ireland are you know they're they're in a fantastic run of form they've gone to New Zealand and, and won a series they've won a Grand Slam they've beaten the box so there's no there's no Bach aura in Ireland's heads that's for sure. Now, playing the Springboks in a World Cup is a hell of a lot different to playing the Springboks in an Autumn International or, a, or even a summer tour. It's just different. Tournament play brings out the best in them. So, I, But I think Ireland are, Ireland are good, but Ireland, again, don't have the power uh, that the box have. And I've always thought that what might stop them getting to a semi-final final or winning it is coming up against a team that just has relentless power for 80 minutes. I think I think Ireland can handle New Zealand. I think France will be obviously extremely difficult. The one team that I'd be most worried about from an Ireland perspective is South Africa. And that just 80 minutes of pure attrition you know, they bring off, they bring, uh, uh, empty the bench after 45, 50 minutes, and you've got more monsters coming off the bench. They're not going to go 7 1 against Ireland, but they'll go 6 2 on, off the bench, and the six will be beasts. So you're guaranteed 80 minutes of that. You know, on a given day, Ireland can stand up to that, I think, but that's a toss of a coin, I think. And, and it's, Oh, it's 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 so so difficult to predict, but certainly Ireland are in a better place to go toe to toe with with South Africa than than Scotland are, I think. Albeit Scotland will throw different things at at South Africa than than Ireland will. So if you get to a situation where they've both lost to South Africa, then the last game of the group becomes the shootout, and that's I'm assuming <laughs> dangerous word that Ireland will handle Romania and Tonga, and I think. Do you think Scotland will come through those unscathed as two wins as well? Yeah, yes, yes, I do, yeah. Um, hopefully, un- but I think with two wins and hopefully unscathed, unscathed in terms of injuries, they'll be both physical, obviously. Tonga, in particular, will be, um, will be very, very physical. So, yeah, two wins for Ireland there and two wins for Scotland there.
So it could all it could all come down to the last day, which could be. Uh, I, I suppose Scotland record against Ireland isn't great either but when you're in the cauldron of a World Cup and the pressure is on it's maybe harder to be absolutely de- de- definitive on that um, just as well Stuart Hogg not going that really caught people by surprise I mean I suppose look players can leave whenever they want but it seems a strange one to leave prior to the World Cup and he, he was a talismanic player I mean Finn Russell has seems to be fitting in better now but Stuart Hogg was, was a player who could just produce a bit of magic for them uh, he, he was his best days were definitely behind him and I am pretty certain that Hogg would not have started against South Africa I think Blair Kinghorn was going to start that game even if Hogg was in the, was in the squad and I think that, that may, even if they if they did bring him, I think if, if he was dropped for Kinghorn, that would have created a bit of a hullabaloo in the, in the squad. That could have been a bit of a sideshow that the Scottish management could have done without. Okay. So I don't think the Scottish management are all that annoyed or, or upset or put out in any way, actually, that Hogg isn't in the squad. Because Kinghorn... Kinghorn was the coming man. In fact, Kinghorn has arrived, and Kinghorn, Kinghorn was was going to start at fifteen. And just talking quickly about Finn Russell, uh, look, I know it's all about uh, when you're playing South Africa, but again, he has the the opportunity here. He does seem to know relish or be more suited to the way Scotland are playing. They've they've found a role for him. He always looked. Occasionally looked an interloper, but now he actually looks part of the of the whole setup. Yeah, I think he's he's happy. He's happiest now that he's possibly ever been in a Scotland jersey. His relationship with with Gregor Townsend, as we know, has been incredibly topsy turvy. It's really healthy now to the point that Russell captained Scotland in one of the World Cup warm up games against France. So that just shows you the arc of their relationship is really <laughs> incredible. You know, I spoke to him at the squad announcement a few weeks ago. He is more mature. He's a father now. He is more mature and I think happier in his own skin. The Scotland squad looks happier than it did four years ago. Townsend's coaching and his running of the, of the squad is different. He was a bit of a control freak four years ago. <clears throat> and that's not just Finn Russell saying that. That was a lot of players saying that. To, an, to a kind of unhealthy degree. Townsend thought he was doing the right thing, but he was kind of suffocating in his intensity. He's given them a bit more freedom now, and it works. It's working, without question. We're still getting the kind of X-factor moments from Russell, but what I've noticed in the last while is that his game management has has improved enormously. And it's not just about the Finn Russell moments of magic. It's about his overall running of the game, his running of the back line, the way he sees it. And I think that's partly to do with his own maturing. It's partly to do with the fact that he's happier in the way that the way the team is going. And also he's got playmakers around him now. Like he's like he hasn't had before. Like Kinghorn is a playmaker. Hugh Jones, uh Sione Tuapolotu. He's got two wingers who can score tries. He has a lots of stuff, lots of bells and whistles around him. And I think the burden on him to create is less. I mean, that suits him. That actually makes him even more dangerous. I think he's he's a more complete player now than he has been probably at any time in his Scotland career. Well, that must give them some 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 hope. And uh, you know, as I say, group of death. We don't really know what's going to happen, but I, I have a feeling it's going to possibly come down to that that last game between Ireland and Scotland for for the, for the <laughs> quarter finals. It could do. Like if. Uh, like, if Scotland were to lose to South Africa, then obviously Scotland will be hoping that South Africa polymerise Ireland. Because, because then that would mean Ireland have two weeks to stew on that mm. before they play Scotland in that final game. Yeah. We know what we're like. If, if South Africa do a number on Ireland, everyone's going to say, oh, it's happening again. We've picked too early. Yeah. This team is going to pop. Bloody, all that negativity is going to close in on the Ireland team. That's what Scotland are kind of hoping for. That's what, that's what they're hoping for. 
I'm not saying it's going to happen, but that would be a scenario that would be that would play into Scotland's hands if Ireland go into that final game on the back of a beating by the box and loads of uncertainty and negativity closing in on them. And now it's time to get serious about Ireland. Ireland's group is Ireland, South Africa, Tonga, Romania, and I forgot uh, Scotland. Scotland. I forgot. I forgot <laughs> Scotland. We've just had Tom English on there talking. I'm getting tired. I'm nearly at the 80 minutes here. Um, let's look at some of the minnows first. We'll go to Alan. Um, Tonga and uh, Romania. Romania. Yeah. So we we'll start with Romania. They were the, they're you know they're only in the World Cup because Spain played an eligible player again. Again, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> but they are they, they do have something I hadn't realised. They actually have a bronze medal from the 1924 Olympics because USA won the Olympics in 1924, beating France in the final. But there was only one other team in the competition. It was Romania. They lost both games and they still got a bronze medal. <laughs> so, but and you know their their peak was during the communism time. Since communism has uh, disappeared in Romania. They've only beaten one tier one team once, and that was Italy back in 2004, I think it was. So they, they've gone. They were a huge team. They're, they was funded by the Communist Party. They were the police and the army. They were the made two major teams, and they were fully funded. And they were a really dangerous team. Uh, it's just no longer the case, unfortunately. So you want to be putting 80 points on them? Ax- absolutely. I- Ireland have scored in the. La- they played them in the World Cup three times. They've won 44, 14, 45, 17, 44, 10. So we're hoping to get past 40, to have 40 points this time. Tonga, Tonga are much more interesting because they have players like Peter Aki and Leva Fafita, both ex Connacht players, um, in the squad. Um, we've only ever played Tonga twice. Uh, the 1987 World Cup, we beat them 40 points to 19. Uh, and then in 2003, um, Mark McHugh, who was playing for Connacht at the time, scored a try on his debut and his only appearance for Ireland um, in Tonga. Um, so they're <laughs> they've never made it out of the pool, but they did beat France in New Zealand in 2011. Yeah, that caused the, the biggest thing. And they've also brought back players, haven't they? They, they have. They've brought, back, they've brought back a lot of players, um, New Zealand and Australia players. So they could be, they could be more dangerous than, than people realise. Um, but I think Ireland have the perfect run-up in that they start with Romania and then they've got Tonga so they can build themselves up. And I think they should have enough to beat Tonga. Danny, who have you got for us? Uh, South Africa. So it, it it's going to come down for me uh, all down to that 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 third game. Um, I think Ireland are going to get the the edge over them. Uh, Ireland have Why? won. Why? Uh, well, Ireland have won uh, three of the last five meetings between them between the the, the two sides. Um, I do think uh, like South Africa looked good against New Zealand um, the last day, but before that they, they the wheels had kind of come off. I don't think Ireland are going to give. South Africa as much opportunity as New Zealand did in that game. Um, also think that Ireland will be focused on this one, this this game, much more than they were on the Scotland game. And they've been, I, I feel like they would have pinpointed this one and they're going to go hammer and tongs. And I really think Ireland, they have they have the game to, to beat South Africa, but it will be tight. Can they handle the physicality of the fact that they're going to be a 6-2 bench and it's going to be a war zone out there. It's, it's, there isn't going to be any subtlety from South Africa. Ireland have the players and they have the skills and they might have the plans, but can they do it? I think they can, and um, I think a big help is that two-week break afterwards. You know, you've got guys that are... Um, they, they have no worry about it, an, another game next weekend. Um, it, it, they've got that extra break, so they know that they can go hammer and tongs and leave everything out there. And you've got this is this is the reason why guys like Peter O'Mahony are going to be brought uh, for that game to, to really kind of get in um, the South African faces, like he did in the, the uh, URC final. Really kind of wound up the the, the stormers forwards. And I think he's Never. going to do the same. Peter O'Mahony <laughs> didn't wind people up. He's, well, he's a, the funny thing is, like South Africa got to come into the URC because they wanted to learn to play different types of rugby. But I think it has helped Ireland to lose any fear of the South African teams because the Irish teams do quite well against the South African teams even in South Africa and I think yes they're, they're big men but the Irish team aren't small either like the Irish pack is a pretty decent size and yes they have some, some super big human beings especially when they come off the bench but I think Ireland have a they're, they're well capable and there certainly isn't any sort of fear factor that there used to be 
Dave, you don't like the South Africans? No, nope, can't stand them. <laughs> think, 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 they are, think they are horrifically overblown. I think this is a country that produces some fantastic backs and absolutely has, no, has, has an English-like fear of using them. Um, you have Colby, you have uh, Moody, you have Alansa, you have Willie Daru, probably one of the best fullbacks in the world, and you don't use them. Uh, I'm sorry. All Ireland has to do, don't give away penalties in your own half. They can kick to the corner and, and, and give Martin Marks, Malcolm Marks, uh, a push over choice. Um, they have no subtlety, so you just be subtle against them. It's really, really simple. Um, I'm looking at Scotland. Um, I think Scotland have every right to sue Rugby World Cup for taking the mick. Uh, they should never, <laughs> the way they have been playing the last couple of years, they should not be in this group. I think the one thing Tom English mentioned, which is a big elephant in the room for them, was Stuart Hogg retiring is a bigger blow for Wales than even Alan Wynn and Justin Tipperidge combined retiring for Wales. I think he gave them something else. Well, you had Stuart Hogg on the pitch with Finn Russell. You had two points of element of the unknown. I think the fact that Hogg is retired means that Russell will be more restrained. Everything Tom English said about what Scotland can do is right. But what he also forgot to say was the biggest problem for Scotland is Scotland had this amazing ability to shoot themselves in the foot. They will eat, they are as likely to tie you up in knots and run rings around you, and then they're as likely to throw an intercept pass on their own line. This is Scotland. They are, they are, they've been really, really badly messed around by this group. But that's the way the cookie crumbles. That's an issue for, for the World Cups. They shouldn't happen again. But I think they are capable of beating South Africa and Ireland, but I don't think they will because they will throw an intercept pass in the halfway line. OK, well, you were dealing with Scotland and Ireland, so you've already got from South Africa to Scotland, which is a great bit of uh, juxtapositioning. <laughs> so tell us now about Ireland. What, what, how are, are Ireland's record, whatever you, way you look at it, is awful. It's nine attempts. The best they've managed is, is quarterfinals. They've had a couple of times, 80, I know for a fact, 87, 99, and maybe one other they didn't get out of the group. They're now going there uh, as nearly the favourites, which uh, scares the hell out of me. But is that just because... I, think I, I can't deal with the fact that... I, I think what you need to do is stop hanging around with people who hang around with statistics. Statistics mean nothing. <laughs> they mean nothing. They're nothing. All statistics are there to be broken. France are favourites as well. France have never won the competition. They've, they've made finals. I think it's worse to make finals. New Zealand got hung up on the fact that they, had, they actually hadn't won it in X amount of years and they were the number one team and then they went and won it. South Africa, let's be fair, South Africa won the World Cup having never been in a World Cup. Um... England, England have, England, have won, England have been in uh, three finals, four finals, and they've only won one. So it's, the stats go out the window. It is on the day. Everything that's in the past, the past is the past. The future is, is yet to be determined. We go out there, take every game as it is. Yes, there's a chance we might not get out of the quarterfinals, but that's much the vagaries of the way the draw was three years ago as anything else. Yeah. And we're paying now for how bad we were four years ago. So I, that's the weird thing. We could be a far worse situation in four years' time, but get an easier group. I think we can make the final. I think it's going to come down. We have to beat South Africa. We beat South Africa, win the pull, we're in the final. We lose to South Africa, finish second. I'm not so sure we make the final. That's just how important that game is. I think we can beat them for the reasons the lad says. Win that game, top the pull. You're facing I likelihood of... Uh, you know, it's a very good chance you're getting up playing Wales in the semi-final which would mean yeah, that my, um, my, my life is over if we meet Wales in the semi-final <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I, my relations will be getting a few phone calls over there uh, Danny you were trying to come in there what, 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 what are you feeling and, and come back again on this it's just it really is it's very, it's very simple if they beat South Africa, they will play New Zealand or France. And if they lose to South Africa, what the hell did they play in New Zealand or France? So it's it's pretty it's pretty it's, it's pretty simple when you look at it like that way. Uh, as long as they beat uh, Scotland um, at the end, if they did did lose to South Africa, but um, we've known about this for four years. Uh, Dave, I know you're going to love this one, but here's a few statistics for you. Oh, so, <laughs> Ireland have played 38 tests since the last World Cup, and they've only lost seven. You know, they're on their best current winning streak of 13 matches in a row. And, and they've got an 82% winning record under Andy Farrell. This is, this is lit the reason why everyone is kind of looking at Ireland is that they are primed. They are in the best form that they have ever been. OK, can they cover, Alan, can they cover Johnny Sexton getting injured? Can they cover if two of their props go down? Um, you know, yeah. There are, there are issues there. We know that. And it's an attritional game. And that South Africa game could be attritional. So could Tonga. Scotland can be pretty difficult to handle as well on that front. So, yeah. Uh, it, what's the squad depth like? 
I think it's it's um I think the out half isn't too bad. I'm I'm you know I'm I'm quite interested in Crowley. I think he's going to turn into a fabulous rugby player. I think he's got a he's got a brain in his head. He did quite well last week against Samoa, playing in brutal conditions again with a pack that wasn't doing particularly well. Um, but to give him any sort of front football, I think he sees space as well, if not better than any out half in Ireland. Um, and and Byrne is actually a very very solid player. I think I think he gets an awful lot of bad press. Um, it would be preferable that Sexton was there. It has to be said. The bigger issue is loose head. Uh, I think Dave Kilcoyne is slightly injured, and they've, they've brought him. And certainly, um, Jeremy Lockman. Jeremy Lockman didn't didn't cover himself in glory last week. Um, I thought he got fairly beaten up and eaten alive by Samoa um, which puts the loose head side of the scrum under huge pressure if Porter isn't playing at his best but if Porter's playing at his best and fully fit um, I think that's okay then Dave mentioned earlier on everyone goes on about uh, Tyg Furlong but Finley's playing just as good as him these days if not better so I think from that point of view we're okay the other issue is the hooker yeah the, the hooking issue Dave I mean it's, it's a bit messy you're, you're talking about Rob Herring is 100% fit we're told but you wonder are the other two and then you've got young Stewart and maybe Dave Heffernan would be in next in um, line. The way I look at it is I think we survived. I think we've done incredibly well on this 13 run game by having somebody who is not the country's best hooker playing at hooker. We've never had the country's best hooker at hooker. We've had one of the country's best uh, rugby players playing in the number two jersey. I think I do think the lineout is a bigger issue. I do think Herring is the best lineup for a lot of them, but again. We've known that about Sheehan. We've known that about Keller. They are not, they are, well, Sheehan, certainly in Sheehan's case, he's a converted back row and only recently converted. Um, Keller has been carrying an injury. I think Stewart was playing, was, was, was nervous because he knew, which is actually what happened probably, was that chances are he was only getting onto the, onto the plane if there was an injury and he played like somebody who didn't know quite whether to... To, to be relaxed or something like that. I think. Thanks, Jerry. I think in the in the great scheme of things, like I say, I'm not worried about do we have the best hooker in the world. We have one of the best rugby players. The best hooker is is Harry. Okay, I want you to pick one player who's absolutely key, not Johnny Sexton. Who's who are you? Lo- <laughs> who are you looking to, Danny? James Ryan. Okay, Johnson is my choice. Yeah, I I I I'm inclined to agree with you. I think he's a hell of a leader. Uh, Alan. Gary Ringrose. I think he, he's got absolutely everything in an outside centre. He's got the power now that he didn't have before and his defensive playing is, is phenomenal. The Irish defence is the best defence in the world. Um, and that is... Defences are what win championships. Dave? Van de, Van de Fleur, he's the only seven. Everybody else can play in any other position, but he's the only definite first-choice seven we have. And he's been immense. Uh, the whole back row is going to be huge, but Van de Fleur, because he's the only definite seven. Okay, it's time now to put your views on the table. I want each of you to tell me who's going to be in the final, who's going to win it, and if Ireland aren't in the final, at what stage of the competition are they going to get knocked out? For me, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going all in, uh, in Andy Farrell, I trust, and I think Ireland are going to win it, and I think they're going to beat the Kiwis in the final. Okay, that's what uh, Oliver Lee was looking for this morning down in New Zealand there. That's a big call. It is recorded. We'll be playing that back. <laughs> yeah, Alan. I, 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 I also believe in, in what Andy Farrell is doing. I think he's got the squad to do it. Uh, and I think they'll beat South Africa in the final. Dave? Um, I think Ireland would, Ireland would definitely make the final. I think it's going to depend on who comes to the other side of the draw. I think if it's anybody else but France, they win. If it's France, I think just purely based on crowd and emotion, I think they could, get, I think they could lose, but... Um, the only game I'm really worried about is that quarterfinal. I really am because it's just it's, it's, it's in their heads. But if, it's, if they're fine, they'll make the final. They will probably win the final. But I do think France at home is a factor. But I would point out, as Alan mentioned earlier, 1924 Olympics, America bet France in the final. That was played in Paris. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, that's one side of the draw. Who's going to come out of the other side of the draw, Danny? Not, not for the final, but who do you actually see getting to the semi-finals? Who, who's your gut feel? Uh, I, I, I do think uh, Fiji. Like I know there's a little bit more kind of looking at them. Um, I got lucky. I got train. I got to train with them uh, about five years ago up in Dublin. And uh, the one thing that that came out of that uh, of spending a day with them was that 
if they ever got their set piece right or had the, the attitude to kind of sit down and, and work on that and enjoy it like they are now, they'd be, they'd be a scary, scary team. Alan, who would you see? Well, Fiji, probably. I mean, the Deegans seem to have got this Fijian bug. Out. Well, he's taking Fiji, so I'm going to go with Argentina because I think Argentina have, have gone very quiet and I think they're slowly but surely building themselves up to in, into, you know, they, they still have an awful lot of experienced players. Uh, they play a great brand of rugby. They are so passionate. It's, it's, they're, it's, they're just so joyous to watch. Um, they also always have the best jersey, that has to be said. <laughs> Fair I enough. love that jersey. I think it's brilliant. But no, I think Argentina could be um, could be the ones that that sneak out of that the other side. Who you see coming out of the other side? Well, because at least one of these teams is gone. One of the really, really terrible teams at the moment is likely just fluked their way through through a series because they're playing a series of other equally as bad teams. I am going to go for Eddie Jones taking the mick. A poor Australia team getting to a semi final, getting absolutely hockeyed. Okay, you hear it here, folks. We've got people getting Ireland winning this. We've got people coming, seeing Ireland get to the finals. Um, we've got about three minutes left, so I want you to focus now back on the Connacht players that are in that squad. Um, we know watching them week in, week out, but who do you think is going to really... Is, is there one of those players could come out of this World Cup as sort of a superhero? Danny. Mark Hansen. Like he, he, like he, he nearly is at that level anyway. But um, you're looking at him. He, he's, he's, he's a lot. Uh, he's very re- resilient. He's played nearly all the matches, kind of in the build-up to this. He, he's got less miles in the legs than uh, a couple of the other wingers in the squad. I think we see him through, right the way through the the whole tournament. Um, if he can get, if he gets lucky against uh, Romania and we have a good game against Scotland, you know, he could be in with a chance of being a top try scorer. Alan. Well, I, I think Finley's going to come out of the shadow of, of Ty Furlong. You know, he's he models himself on, on Ivor the Boneless. He's a Viking, he has his hair, he has all that, but he's also he also backs it up. He also backs it up with his the, the quality of his play. Um, and I think he's got better and better. His hands are better than Furlong's at this stage. Um, his scrubbing Would it improved. be fair to say he's learned a lot from Furlong? Oh, absolutely. Oh, there's no, absolutely no question. Um... But he's, he's just, he's learned, I remember not being that fond of Finley when he arrived first because I wasn't sure he was going to be that good, but to watch him all the way along and see him where he's going, I think he's going to, he'll be the world-class prop that we finish with. Dave, in 30 seconds. Pick. But, well, because the other two reviews, the other two, I'll go with Bundy because Bundy's the glue that holds it together. All the other centres play better when he's there. He is uh, huge for the terms and team spirit. I think he's learned an awful lot from having been red-carded over the last couple of years. He's, he's, he is... Aggression, but he's he's contained, and I think he's going to be huge because he's the glue. That's the story of the World Cup, folks. It's all on in Murty Rabbits. 52 live games here with all games on multiple televisions. i got to thank some people here to my panel. We've got Alan Deegan, Danny Deegan and Dave Finn, Oliver Lee in Auckland, Brendan Nell in Johannesburg, Tom English in Glasgow, Adrian and Kieran for looking after so well here in Murty's, Jerry in the studio, Donal, our site engineer, and I've got about 30 seconds left, so I'm going to say again about Murty's, get in here, enjoy it, uh, the ultimate rugby venue, give Craggy Rugby a listen. These guys work for Craggy Rugby, I do a bit for them as well, and that's where you can hear about Connacht. It's all about Connacht. Connacht women, Connacht seniors, Connacht juniors. That's it. From Murty Rabbits this evening, good night. Thank you for listening. And we'll talk to you again very soon. Loose, cut it loose. Break out or nothing changes. Sad and confused. Don't wait until you...